Thanks everyone for joining us for this Talks at Google event. We have two fantastic authors here for you today, Corey Doctorow and John Scalzi. So we're graced with their presence. And so Corey Doctorow, author of Walk Away. So Corey is a science fiction author, activist, journalist, and blogger. He's the co-editor of Boing Boing, that's boingboing.net, and the author of the best-selling Little Brother, which is actually just recently optioned by Paramount. So it's going to be a movie with Don Murphy producing. Pretty cool stuff. So he's also the former European director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and he co-founded the UK Open Rights Group. He was born in Toronto, Canada, and now lives Ooh. in Burbank. <laughs> so that's, that's for Toronto or for Burbank? That's for Toronto. For Toronto. <laughs> that's for Toronto. <laughs> no, no Burbank love? Okay, and then we have John Scalzi, author of The Collapsing Empire. He's one of the most popular and acclaimed SF authors to emerge in the last decade. Yeah, that's right, Corey. His massively successful debut, Old Man's War, SF is in science fiction. Not, uh, not, San, <laughs> not, not San Francisco, yeah. His massively successful debut, Old Man's War, won him the science fiction's John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer. His New York Times bestsellers include The Last Colony, Fuzzy Nation, and Red Shirts, which won 2013's Hugo Award for Best Novel. And Locken. Mat material from his widely read blog, Whatever, has also earned him two other Hugo Awards. He lives in Ohio with his wife and daughter. And let's put our hands together for them to welcome them. Hello, Corey. Hello, John. It's nice to see you again. I know. It's been so long since it I've seen has. you. It has. <laughs> so John is at the very end of his tour, and I'm at the very start of mine. John has come from my future to warn me about the terrible catastrophes in the coming weeks. Right. It's, it's hydrate and hand sanitizer. These are the two things that will get you through uh, most of these particular events. Right. Well, hydration will get you through times of no hand sanitizer better than hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer will get you through times of no hydration. There's so much truth in that statement. There I really even, is. I don't even know where to start. I didn't even it. realize until I was halfway through it that it's actually true. It is actually yeah. true. You were trying to be you were trying to be arch, and yet yeah. you've actually spoken a home truth it's, that it's is true. really useful to people who are on the don't road. Don't drink hand sanitizer. Don't drink hand sanitizer. <laughs> I mean, no matter no matter how fruity it smells, it's just it's, it's going to end in pain. Yeah, that's right. But you do. I mean, you do see a lot of people and you shake a lot of hands. And the very first time that I ever went on tour, I shook somebody's hand in San Diego. And the next thing I knew, I was in Minneapolis. And Phoenix was somewhere in between that. And I was right. just like, can't, can't do that again. I don't know what I did in Phoenix, but I can't ever go back to that city now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so John, uh, you wrote this book, The Collapsing Empire. Yes, I did. Uh, uh, a kind of eco-catastrophe that you didn't realize was an eco-catastrophe until the reviews started coming in. Well, yeah. What, what happened was this is, the, this is the classic idea of the author so fixated on their own specific idea that they don't really think about uh, necessarily about uh, the obvious wider implications that are clear to everyone else. In my specific case, when I was writing The Collapsing Empire, um, I was thinking about uh, the age of sail and the age of empires, you know, basically between uh, the 15th through uh, 18th centuries uh, in Europe. And, uh, and what I was thinking about, what would happen to all those empires in Europe, you know, Portugal, the UK, Spain, um, if all of a sudden um, the jet stream and the ocean currents uh, just suddenly went away or shifted so significantly that all the things that they took for granted about how they were going to get around the world to get to the new, uh, you know, the new world or to get to Japan uh, just suddenly disappeared. Um, and this is relevant to me because I created, because I, because I strongly believe that the speed of light is not only a good idea, but actually the law and that you wouldn't want to go close to the speed of light anyway, because anytime you hit something, space is only mostly empty. Right. Um, so that when you hit something, of course, boom, that all turns into energy and you're doomed. Um, so I created this, uh, this thing called the flow, which is a sort of uh, extra dimensional uh, conduit that gets you from one place to another, because it doesn't have to obey the rules of this particular universe, because it sort of sits on top of it. It's basically a cheat but a very interesting cheat. But it works like ocean currents, or it works like uh, the jet stream. Um, and uh, it's a feature of the universe that we have no control over. And so they built this entire uh, empire using the flow, just assuming that the flow is always going to be there, uh, because as far as they know, it always has been. But the universe doesn't care what you think about 
permanence or what you need. It's basically just going to do what it's going to do, and eventually the flow goes away. So I'm busy thinking about these parallels to you know, ocean currents and the flow, and people coming up to me uh, at, uh, at um, these events, and they're going, it's about oil, isn't it? And I'm like, I guess it is, you know? <laughs> Because it's the thing that happens where you have uh, you you write something and you put it out in the world and it's no longer uh, just exclusive in your brain. It is now in dialogue with what's in the brain of somebody else. Uh, so the person who's looking at it going, "This is obviously about oil," or "This is obviously about climate change," or "This is obviously about such and such." Sometimes you know they can get really wacky about it, but other times it's like, "Yep," because I also live I live in the now, right? right. And, and I do actually think about oil and climate change. And even if I'm not thinking about them directly, obviously um, they're going, that sort of stuff is going to seep into what I do. I, I also wonder if there isn't a parallel to be drawn, though, with um, uh, sort of theory-free knowledge, right? So one of the, the thing that brings all these people into catastrophe right. is that um, they don't really know how the flow works, right. but it's worked so well for so long that they assume it'll be stable. Right. And we have a lot of things that we do that are kind of folkways rather than reality. Sure. You know, we'll A, B, split our way into some optimal pattern right. that we don't really know why it works, and so we bet it's stable for a long time, and so we build up big edifices on it, and then all of a sudden it, it changes, or it turns out that it's fragile. What happens is, like, uh, in example, uh, science fiction fandom. There's this uh, saying that uh, if you do something once, it's a tradition. If you do it twice, it's a hollowed tradition. And what that means is that uh, people get so used to doing things heuristically, they don't even question whether that process makes sense outside of that specific thing. Um, and we do, as humans, we do things so heuristically. It's like, why do you do this? Because it's always worked. Why do you do it this way? Well, because when I did it the other way, it didn't work the way I wanted it to, so I'm always going to do this. Can you explain why this works the way it does? It just works the way it does. Stop asking me these questions. I have things to do. Mm -hmm. um, we do things so heuristically um, that what we end up doing is we we become trapped to a process without understanding how the process works. And that's, um, of course, how, how we fall down. Mm -hmm. you know? Now, uh, let's segue a little bit into walk away. Sure. Uh, and we're talking about uh, one of the things that you do in, um, in walk away is that you actually posit um, that a lot of people are actually going to cooperate in, in trying times uh, rather than go, oh, no, it's every person for themselves and, and let's you know, uh, get at it. Now, there would some people who would say, heuristically, that when you go and uh, have a crisis, the, the, the thing that you should do is just sort of look out for yourself and assume that everybody else is going to take care of themselves. Do you, you don't yeah, think so the case. I mean, the the, the theory that 99.9% uh, .9 of people are total bastards it has a <laughs> has a, a a really significant statistical uh, problem with it, which is that the people who evince this theory almost always also say, "But not you, me, and all the people we know." Right. So the likelihood in a world where 99.9% .9 of people are total bastards that everyone that you know isn't mm -hmm. is really low, right? It's much more likely that the people that you know are a representative selection of the people around them, and that they have the dual nature of all fragile and imperfect humans, which is to say that on a good day, they uh, rise to the occasion, and on a bad day, they do things that haunt them forever as their regrets. And what, <laughs> what really matters in terms of a society is not how it works when it's working well, but what lessons it teaches us that come to mind easily when things go wrong. You know, the liquidation preference for a civilization that's based on uh, every person for themselves, my gain is your loss, uh, let's all be rational, self-interested actors, and through that will emerge some, some kind of competitive but optimized world is that when things go wrong, you see your neighbors as your competitors and not as your potential saviors or people with whom you have some kind of right. mutual destiny or mutual uh, responsibility to. Right. And you know, all of these stories that we have through our history of civilizations falling in ways large and small, whether that's just the lights going out because the power plant collapsed or because we had a horrible quake or, or whatever, or all the way up to you know, the fall of the empire, every one of those situations was not resolved by the people who ran to the hills. Right? By definition, when you run to the hills, you do not solve those problems. It's all solved by the people who run to the middle right. to see how they can help. And you know, coordinating that help is hard. And I always feel like there's um, a lot of drama latent in the story of people who agree with each other 
on what should be done, but disagree about how it should be uh, about how it should be done, and that it's actually a much more compelling drama in the in the end than the easy drama of people who actually disagree about what should be done. Right, the the man versus man story is a lot less interesting than we're all on the same side, but I hate you and I want to kill you story, which is something that you know is much harder to resolve as anyone who's ever gone to Christmas dinner with their family can tell you, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and so Walk Away is a, a a story about people who are consciously trying to uh, form societies that fail gracefully instead of societies that work well. And that they're trying to use the coordinative latent power of technology to get there. That rather than thinking about technology as a thing that helps us manufacture or communicate, that they're thinking about it as a thing that lets us add our labor one to the other, um, even if we don't all agree on what's to be done. And if it turns out that I throw some code or some work into a project that turns out to be superfluous to it, that's OK. We can just, we can just leave it by the wayside or you know, factor it out in, in, in future revisions. Mm -hmm. That um, rather than having someone sit down and tell us all what to do, we all do what we think needs to be done. And we have a tool that lets the parts of it that are useful glom together so that you know, today we can build an encyclopedia the way that we used to you know, apply bureaucracy to the problem of building a, a bake sale. Uh, and tomorrow, maybe we could build skyscrapers and space programs that way. You know, without the kind of coercive hierarchical control, maybe we can use additive labor to do it. I see you shaking your head. Perhaps you should read the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, well, Wikipedia skyscraper. Right. Uh, well, I think well, that there were a lot of people who said they didn't want a Wikipedia encyclopedia for about 10 years, right? right? And there were a lot of people who said that they didn't want a GNU operating system for about 10 years. And they were really right for the first 10 years, right? That's the amazing thing. Like it's, you know, as, as, as Jimmy Whale says, it is a complete disaster in theory. It only works in practice. Right. Well, here's, <laughs> but here's, here's a question um, that, and, and one of the things that uh, you can say is, uh, all right, so the idea of the cooperation is kind of a wonderful thing not to be disputed, um, but how do you keep a wonderful thing, a wonderful communal thing from basically being swamped by the bastards? Well, and that's a problem that the people in this story uh, really contend with. You know, our, we have um, a, a, a new move in the 21st century for resolving disputes, which is forking. Uh, it's, I mean, it's not entirely new. It's just lower cost than it's ever been. There's this thing in Canada where the further west you go, the weirder the Mennonites get. Because uh, Mennonitism is, is a schismatic faith. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it, it, it has this uh, article that you shouldn't uh, be worldly, but worldly is not a crisply defined uh, idea. And right. so what's one person's worldliness is someone else's non-worldliness. I have a friend who's grew, who grew up in a Mennonite community that was founded by people who disagreed about whether or not vertical blinds were cool. Right? They, they thought they were the people who were old order thought they shouldn't be. And so they moved west. Right. So you get all the way west to Saskatchewan. And there's a wonderful science fiction writer named Carl Schrader, who's a, <laughs> uh, a second uh, multi-generational Mennonite. His father was a Mennonite TV repairman, right? And so this was like somehow reconcilable with this this uh, this faith, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a very expensive way of, of of schisming. But we have a much cheaper way of schisming now, which is that we can but we can fork the code, we can keep the code bases reconciled, but we can we can add stuff on it on top of it. And so you know the kind of Debian to Ubuntu model of of um, of schisming. Is a, is a much more interesting one because it allows for a lot of experimentation at the margin, right? You can do a lot of like parallel universe stuff where it's like, well, what if we reran Debian, but we gave up on this principle or we included some non free repositories? We did something else that wasn't, you know, that was key core to Debian. And then you get to find out, like, what's it, how's it work? Instead of having a kind of abstract argument, you can actually try it and see what happens. So it's like a choose your own adventure. It, it, it's or, or, or like parallel, multiple parallel universes. And so right. the walkaways, for better and for worse, you know, the, 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 the thing about walkaways is a sort of Burning Man-ish subculture. But what it is is they, they walk away from the world. They find brownfield sites that have been left behind by the uh, collapse of industrial civilization. They harvest the waste stream that's exhausted off what's left of post-industrial civilization. And using cool tools, they build fully automated leisure communism. And if someone comes along and says, you know, that patch of dirt is mine and that garbage that you're using doesn't belong to you, rather than argue about it, they just go somewhere else because they like all garbage and patches of blighted land are fungible. And so they just go find somewhere else to, 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 to try out their experiment. And they're able to do this for better or for worse. And the worst is that they that there are 
times when doing that actually does cost them something, right. and that they that they can't always reconcile it. And then the people who uh, who have um, uh, kicked them off plot of land A sometimes aren't happy with them walking to plot of land B. Sometimes they're mortally offended that they've walked off. And in, in particular, when um, the walkaways who are walking away are, are scientists who've taken the practical cure for death. Uh, out of the default world and, and, and kind of stolen fire from the gods and, and brought it to everyone else, done a kind of Aaron Swartz sci hub kind of uh, uh, exfiltration of the, of the technology necessary for immortality, the super rich realize that they're going to have to spend the rest of eternity with us and uh, become really, really upset about it. And walking away ceases to be a viable strategy. Now they have to start running away. Yeah. I love watching you talk. Because oh. <laughs> the, the funny thing about Corey is, is like, you're like, Corey, here's a thought. It's like, and he goes, so, whoop, and now, <laughs> this comes out like 10,000 ideas in this, in this uh, uh, stream, like, a, you know, you're, you're the fire hose of ideas. Well, that's kind of you. It's, it's, but it's true, though. And it's like, so when, they, when we were first talking, and they were like, oh, we want to pair you up with Corey. I'm like, yeah, sign me up. I am the, I am the carbon fuel or the carbon rod to his nuclear fuel because he's going to go all over the place, and I'm going to be, oh, OK. <laughs> Here we go. I, I love this analogy. Yeah. I love that you're the inert carbon rod. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but um, <laughs> now actually, here's the thing that that uh, we had talked about in previous things, and I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, uh, approach it to you a little bit. Uh, one of the things that we we were talking about is one of the uh, the issues of um, way back when with primogeniture and how that related to colonialism. Primogeniture means the only one uh, person usually the son inherits. Um, and then colonialism, to an extent, solved that problem because uh, you could go from, uh, you know, you could take those second and third sons or whatever and have them find their own fortunes out in the world. Um, and eventually it, it exhausts itself because there's only so much world out there. Um, and that was, uh, leads to a kind of collapse that caused for example, World War One, and then as a consequence, World War Two. Um, but let me let me apply that to the to the world of the walkways. One of the one of the posits here is that when you fork, you can just go somewhere else. Sooner or later, don't you run up some, run out of somewhere else? Yeah. So so uh, in that regard. Um, so, so to, to kind of reiterate this, this earlier part, Thomas Piketty in Capital of the 21st Century, he hypothesizes that the age of colonialism created, allowed every family to create as many dynastic fortunes as they had sons, and that eventually you run out of colonies that you can get dynastic fortunes out of. But the dynastic fortunes had a, had a character of rivalrousness, right? The fortune that I have is a fortune you can't have. What the walkaways get is like a kind of federated universe of different, slightly different variations on their ethics and on their, on their uh, design aesthetics and on their practices, their engineering practices, sure. their social practices. And so you're right that there may, there may be some uh, element that is optimal for you that's not that isn't perfectly suited in any of the places, sure. but they're also not super intensely specified. So you know, the, like the likelihood that there's something that's really important to you that no one will tolerate and you can't find anywhere to do it, that's a pretty low likelihood. Right. It's it's the, you know, and this coordination, it's a really remarkable thing. In fact, one of the um, impetuses for this book was a thing Google did. Uh, they um, uh, you guys built a data center in Belgium in a, a valley where uh, two-thirds of the time you don't need chillers. It's the ambient temperature is low enough that you don't need chillers. And the rest of the time, they just shut off the, the servers because the file system is distributed and the, you can coordinate the labor. And this was a, a remarkable realization for me that we could, um, we could use coordination mm -hmm. to simply shunt around resources to wherever they're le least environmentally catastrophic, wherever they're kind of most <laughs> harmonious with the rest of the world. Right. And we could realize these new efficiencies that um, really challenge the, the notion that you can't have infinite growth in a finite world. Mm -hmm. uh, infinite growth implies that um, 
you don't have any kind of process automation and you don't have any changes in what people want. Right. Uh, and that, that you know, we'll just keep growing, we'll like keep making cars that have X tons of steel in them and we can do that infinitely. That's obviously not true, right. but there doesn't seem to be any bottom in sight to how few tons of steel you can put in a car. And so in that regard, we can get some, some extremely flexible growth out of there. And then when you add to that using coordination to move cars and people close to each other when they need them and then apart when they don't, boy, you can sure get a lot of cars, people's miles, seats, without having to necessarily multiply the number of tons of steel by the number of people uh, to get the number of cars. It's the effective use of the car as opposed to the sheer number of cars. Right, right. I mean, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's better than, than the mere despotic dominion over a car that, after all, you then have to take care of and find a place to put and, right. and all the rest of it. It's like, and, and which is inevitably the third best car or the fifth best car as opposed to the very best car for your needs because you can't afford that. Uh, the, the, the interesting move of science fiction, one of the best moves of science fiction, is to take a technological phenomenon mm -hmm. and see if it can be extracted from its social and economic Sure. context and whether it still works. This is steampunk, right? right. Like what, is, what, is, what does it mean if you could like have the machines without the factory, right? Mad scientists could do productivity uh, that are characteristic of an assembly line, but they could do it all alone in their labs, right? Um, to imagine something like fleet vehicles without market capitalism, yeah. right? Without, without even communal ownership, Mar uh, you know, that were just a kind of epiphenomenon of cooperative work without any formalized structures. Right. That's a, like, it's a really provocative thought experiment to imagine what kind of arrangements we'd get out of that. I wish I had a car and then a car drives up and you go into your car and then you say, goodbye car, thank right. you for driving me. Right, and if it turns out there are no cars, then, then some other thing that you might wanna do is brought to your attention that doesn't require a car. You right. know, there's a whole uh, group of people in Walk Away that are um, uh, the remnants of a of a investment bubble in Zeppelins, uh, <laughs> and they they you know just like the you know 20 years ago we had this investment bubble that um, used pension funds to teach humanities majors how to write JavaScript. Uh, w w this 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 bubble turns a whole ton of disaffected post millennials into airship builders and pilots but doesn't actually produce a functional airship economy. And so um, a bunch of them just start building airships, but they, they, they are non-propelled airships. They, they have minimal impellers. And so they just go where the winds are blowing. Right. But because they're, they were all part of this global phenomenon, they kind of know somewhere wherever the winds might blow them. And so it's a kind of movable party. You sort of check to see who's on the, the next airship through town and whether you know them. And when you get on the airship, you check to see whether the next town that the wind is blowing you to is a place where there might be someone you want to hang out with, right. and the, the uh, automation marries the two. Right. Fascinating. <laughs> now, um, do you think there are antecedents, I mean, not antecedents in, in, your, uh, in, in the human experience, but antecedents uh, to what you're doing uh, in science fiction? I mean, one of the things that I, I kind of see Rockaway being is almost like the seed culture for uh, Ian Banks' culture series. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think Banks is uh, Banks definitely was was writing about what a post scarcity world would look like, but the, if there's a difference in our angle, he's he's got this fate accompli. Sure. Right, and I'm and I'm thinking about the transitional state, which is a really interesting moment to think right. about it, and. His, his uh, emphasis is really on uh, manufacture as opposed to coordination. Right. So it's, it, his, you know, his m magical technology is the, to date, still rather fanciful idea mm -hmm. that you know, matter can be conjured, you know, organized matter can be conjured up out of code, which you know, notwithstanding a few 3D printers around the margin is not a thing that we do very reliably at mass scale uh, yet. Right. Uh, but for me, it doesn't really matter if you've got 3D printers and walkaway. Through walkaway works pretty good, even if all you've got is um, just people who are assembling stuff. Right. Because they're still able to do process improvement. They're still able to feed back to one another. They're still using software and networks to take whatever it is they can make and make it better on demand, continuously, right. all around the world. It's, so it's it's hardware that acts like a software object. Right. So basically, what. Uh one of the things that we talked about earlier is like the the triangle you said of, yeah. of the you know what you have process I, tell me remind yeah so me the, the triangle of of, of uh, post scarcity up here you have what we want 
So Keynes wrote this essay in 1930 about how his grandchildren would struggle to fill their lives after the 15-hour work week was right. introduced because there would be no reason to, to work beyond that because we could fill all our material wants. And you know the, the resolution to Keynes's paradox today is that Keynes dramatically underestimated how much people would want. Right. That, that, people's, that people's desires were elastic and responsive to new material goods. Or a cynic might say that people are amenable to marketing messages and want things that they don't really want. They can be convinced in the moment that they want something that actually, in, objectively, they don't want. But, but whatever your explanation is, <laughs> right. that's up in this corner. Down here, you have, you have the um, uh, production. Right. But over here, you have what you have the uh, ability to coordinate what we want with what we can make. Right. And you know the thing that allows you know, the port of Guangzhou to fire a shipping container full of Happy Meal toys at the port of Los Angeles one a second, 365 days a year, like a rail gun firing tchotchkes, you know, is that's coordination, right? These right. long supply chains are all built up out of coordination technology. It's a, it's a, a marvel to behold, and it's such an everyday marvel that we, we don't even don't notice it. it yeah. We think about 3D printers as being miraculous. What's really miraculous is that McDonald's can sell you a cow with a beef of a thousand, or a burger with a beef of a thousand cows in it. Right. Right? That like we can do these incredible, complex, seemingly fragile supply chains that nevertheless are really robust against even you know the burgeoning climate problems of, of long distance shipping and sure. so on. Sure. Sure. Um, and the, the reason I bring that up is because when you were talking about the triangle, you walk away is over here where you're talking about coordination and someone like uh, Banks is over here. That's right. Right. Who's up at the top then? That's oh, well, that's the Huxley, right? That's, right. that's, that's uh, changing what we want. Or Mary Kondo, right? The, the cottage industry of convincing you that all you really want is a smooth river rock that reminds you of your mother, you know, <laughs> as Koire <laughs> Sikra said. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, that, that uh, you know, it's the project of Zen Buddhism, right? The, right. the minimalist project. It, it has it, it. The biggest enemy of minimalism is precarity, right? The, mm -hmm. One of the major reasons that people hold on to stuff is because they're worried that their circumstances might change and they might not be able to afford to get it again, right. even if they don't need it now. Right. You know that's why people save their uh, clothes from when they before they lost weight or gained weight or whatever. Right. It's because they they know that it would cost them more to replace it in the future than they might have, and so it's worth the opportunity cost of leaving it in their closet. Right. Well, no, it's the whole idea that everybody had a grandmother or great grandmother who lived through the depression, sure. who had a big ball of string. Yeah. Right. And that big ball. What are you going to use the big ball of string for? You never know what you might be able to yep. use that big ball of string for. I have a homecoming ritual, which is throwing out all the non-working pens in my parents' kitchen. Right. Whenever I visit Toronto. <laughs> Because yeah. they, they do pile up. Oh, yeah, they do. Well, and I, it's Gresham's law, right? The good pens drive out the bad pens drive out the good, good ones. Because the good pens are the ones you take with you in your bag and lose. And the bad pens are the ones that stay behind. It's just broken pencils. And, and uh, uh, you know that in this bag right now, I have got like six working pens that I've stolen from bookstores that I've been non-tour right. with. That's because right. Because it's the like, there we go. The I'm good gonna... drives out the bad. Right, because and then they'll be like, oh, we don't have any good pens. It's like, I have one. It's like, so, cool. So John, you are incredibly generous being at the end of your term, uh, of your, of term. your tour. Uh, with with putting the emphasis on my book here, yeah. But I really want to talk more about collapsing empire because okay. it's a fascinating and cracking read. Right. And you know, you say that you're you're um, a, a cheerful, quippy guy, and so people mistake you for an optimist, even though you write about <laughs> bastards. But what what I'm interested in is like. Where's the inter why the interest in bastards? Like, what what are they just fun to write? They are fun to write. I mean, bastards are bastards are great fun. You don't want them in your life, right? You know, and we I in this particular in this particular book, I have a character who I love, who is one of my favorite characters that I've ever written, and her name is Kiva Lagos, and she is amazing to read, and she's amazing to watch in action, and you know that if she were your friend and she was calling you, you know, you'd be like. <sighs> Do I want to answer the phone? Do I want to answer the phone? Because whatever's going to happen, it's going to be a thing, yeah. right? And then I've got to deal with it, and I don't want to deal with it right now. I don't have time for this. And you put it down, and immediately afterwards, there's a text that says, I know you're there. Pick up the phone, you bastard. But with more swearing. Well, with much more swearing. She is an epic swearer. She is an epic swearer. And this is, you. you last night we were on tour, and he's, he's like, you don't swear very much. How does that, where does that come from? And I just stared at him. 
right? Because I am, I, you don't know. I never I, hear you swear. You I must only catch you in moments of, uh, of, of great cheerfulness. Of being we very well behaved, yeah. I think it must be it. But in fact, I am, I am an epic swearer. Hmm. Uh, and I come from a grand line of epic swearers. And if you get us all together, um, about 60% of our, of our uh, discourse is swearing in one way or another. Um, but she's, so she's a great character, um, but she's also, she's also a bit of a bastard. She's our bastard, so we like her. Um, but uh, you still have to deal with, you know, what does that mean in terms of character and story? And the other thing is, is as we were talking about uh, the, how our books, even though they were completely unrelated in the writing, are strangely complementary, he is looking at uh, the world of a kind of a post-collapse um, in the, in the uh, middle class and lower classes dealing with that, whereas in the uh, collapsing empire, it is all... Uh, focused on the people who are up at the top. The literal aristocracy. The literal aristocracy, and, and their uh, motivations are um, in some ways very, very, very different because they are the main beneficiaries of this entire interdependent system. The whole point of this system, it, it was built um, so that uh, the one percent or the, actually the one-tenth of the one-tenth of the one percent, uh, would benefit basically from every exchange and every transaction that would ever happen in trade through space. Um, and so when, it, when it, they have evidence that it's a very likely to fail, some of it's debatable uh, evidence, but it is evi very strong evidence nonetheless, um, they kind of break up into you know, three general areas. There's going to be the people who say, um, get everybody on the boat, we're going to see how many people we can save. Um, there are going to be other people who are, there's not enough room in the boat for everybody, kick, 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 you know, they're just make sure my family is on the boat. And then there are the people who are like, I don't know whether or not things are coming to an end or not, all I know is I need to own that boat, right? Because they're going to be the person who is, who is in control. So their motivations are actually materially different um, than hoi polloi, you know, mm -hmm. uh, trying to get through their day or trying to adjust to this world. Their, uh, their uh, focus is going to be on preservation, whether it's preservation on a large scale with as many people as possible, preservation on a small scale with fewer people, or preservation of wealth and capital or whatever. Um, and because of that, uh, in many ways, um, the uh, impulses that are, uh, that um, can be valorized in those particular situations uh, seem to be the ones that also include bastardy. Right, I mean, right. I mean, it's so I love the cynicism of the the political system. Sure. Where it's a uh, there's this hub that called it's called hub, right? Hub that's called hub. That all the all the the ley lines converge on, and um, the the power brokers have granted monopolies right. on different technologies to different spokes. The, the termini of different spokes of the hub, such that any, no one world is self-sufficient, and therefore goods always have to transit hub to, get to, to, to keep each of the colonies running, and if the hub ever breaks down, civilization collapses across, across space. Right. Um, so first of all, this is a lovely bit of cynicism, <laughs> but what I found really great was there, there's this kind of latent thing, which I didn't even realize until the book was over, because as they're scrambling to make plans, even the best of them is not saying, wait a second, how do we create resilience to independent colonies before the, the uh, hyperspace loopholes disappear, right. uh, because um, they're going to be like literally unreachable for the next million years, right. and they can't make their own food, right. right? And no one's like, how do we make sure that that distant world has food? Right. I love that. Right. We're, we're getting a time sub signal here okay, for so uh, Q&A. Yeah, so what that means is, uh, to very briefly, there is in fact one character who is leaning in that direction, mm. um, but, uh, and the next book I believe is actually going to be about how she tries to solve I that kinda particular wondered. problem. I kind of wondered, yeah, I yeah. kind of wondered. There's, 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 it ends on a cliffhanger, which enraged a lot of people, like, what? There's gotta be more? I'm like, look, you know, there's, it's a whole universe. You got. You, you needs a couple of books. So my book be... has a surprise ending too. The last forty percent is just the same word over and over again. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. It's a spoiler. But you know the punctuation in the spacing is very different. It's, it's very very different. It's, it's uh, yeah steganography. All right. So we're uh, going to go into questions now, uh, and we actually have a, a, a thing that we like to do where uh, we 
Uh, Corey suggested it. I agree with it uh, that uh, one question comes from someone who identifies as female. The or next non question, or non binary. The next one uh, comes from someone who identifies as male and non binary. And why do we do that, Corey? We do that because otherwise it's a sausage fest. That is Sorry, correct. Guys. <laughs> so uh, we'll start with. Uh, Are there any people who identify as female or non binary you'd like to ask the first question? And there's yes. a mic runner who will come over for the benefit of the live stream. Right. So anyone raise, uh, raise your hands. Otherwise, we'll move on. There oh, we go. In, back the, in yeah. purple. I'm not going to ask the same question. Okay. Yeah, we, I recognize you from our event last night in Santa Cruz. Nice to see you again. Yes. Uh, so is the retention of wealth immoral? Is the retention of wealth immoral? No, I don't think the retention of wealth is inherently immoral. I think there, be, there, there becomes a point where if your retention of wealth leads to the overall reduction of well-being of other people, I personally think that's immoral because my moral system says, uh, you know, uh, do as well for everybody uh, as much as you can uh, in a very, very general sort of way. And so we, the, when the concentration of wealth uh, means, for example, that we valorize the accumulation of wealth over, say, the well-being of uh, people in, in realms of health or education or housing or any of those sorts of things. And it, it eventually becomes that you really create such a huge disparity between the toppermost one-tenth of one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent and literally everybody else in the world. Yes, then it becomes immoral. But in the sense of, in, in a very real sense, wealth is an abstract concept that we all agree to go along. Um, and so uh, to some extent, we all agree to that particular delusion. The, the problem, uh, the fall down is when we, that all agreed upon delusion means that the majority suffer. Yeah, I, I would take a more like Piketty version of this, right? Where Piketty like basically says, why do we, why do we tolerate imbalances in wealth, right? Why do we not go and take, if we want and someone else has, why do we not go and take? And why do we erect systems to, to establish stable property relationships? And his answer is that um, because when we allocate wealth when people can have wealth who are, uh, as a result of being good allocators of wealth, when being a good allocator of wealth gets you more wealth, mm -hmm. so when you allocate wealth in a way that is beneficial to the world, you get richer, then you get more wealth to allocate. Um, and the, the problem is that intergenerational wealth transfer doesn't, uh, doesn't create efficient capital allocations. And his example is to compare Lillian Betancourt, who's the heiress of the L'Oreal fortune, yeah. who has literally never worked a day of her life, and Bill Gates, who founded the most successful company in the history of the world in his lifetime, and Lillian Betancourt and Bill Gates starting from the same place, um, at the same time, Lillian Betancourt's fortune grew more than Bill Gates did, even though she didn't even allocate capital, she just, she just like gave capital to other people to allocate. Right. And then Bill Gates, after he retired, made more money still as a, in, in total than he had while running the largest company in the world. So Bill Gates doing nothing apart from being a financial plumber as opposed to doing the like non-commodity thing of starting a business that capital can flow into. Right. Bill Gates doesn't make as much money. And so there's this kind of utilitarian uh, but market-oriented reason to do redistribution to, to, to care about intergenerational wealth transfer. But there's a simpler kind of left-right version. So there's a, a wonderful left-wing fantasy writer named Stephen Bruce. He's, an, he's a no-fooling Trotskyist he, fantasy writer. Yes, he is. He, and and uh, you can tell he's a, a Marxist fantasy writer because he has the right ratio of vassals to lords. Uh, normal normal, normal uh, fantasy writers have way too few vassals. But uh, he, um, I, I, I was having drinks with him once, and I said, I don't even know what left and right mean anymore. And I said, he said, means exactly the same thing it's meant since the French Revolution. You ask, what is more important, a property right or a human right? And if the, uh, if the uh, person you're asking says property rights are a human right, they're on the political right. No. And that, that's the, that is the question that divides the two philosophies. Yeah. And so it, once, you, once you come to the conclusion that it's not a human right, that it's merely like a utilitarian thing, then yes, of course, there's, yeah. there's real problems with intergenerational wealth transfer. And the other thing about it, uh, particularly in the United States, is uh, people have a tendency in the United States to believe that there are two pipe types of people. There are the millionaires and the people who are not the millionaires yet. Temporary embarrassed millionaires, as Steinbeck called them. Right, yeah. exactly. And, and if that is your fundamental view of the world, then ultimately uh, the, the question of wealth accretion does, I think, tend towards uh, immorality. So next question. 
Hi, so, hi. Uh, and I, I hate to say this because I know you make your living doing this, but um, would you, uh, what do you think about the fact that to be successful in a post scarcity world, you have to completely ignore all intellectual property law? Uh, and I would argue that open source is successful because it found a way to do just that. But. Yeah, Corey. So I think you've got it wrong about, about free and open source software. I actually think, so, so I think you're right that the free software movement's origins are in opposition to, um, to the idea of copyright uh, and patent, actually, to, against intellectual monopoly more, more, more widely. But it's, it's a brilliant hack. Because what Stallman did with the GPL was he created a regime where the more you strengthen copyright, the more enforceable his license that, that abjured copyright became. And the weaker you made copyright, the less his license was needed to accomplish its goals. And so he, he, he created a head I, heads uh, I win, tails you lose situation in the license. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that um, the idea of... Uh, uh, exclusive rights over um, one's intellectual creations has always been um, a battleground between the utilitarian considerations, mm -hmm. self-deception, and, um, and emotional feelings, animal sentiments. So we have this Lockean intuition that when we infuse something with our labor, it's ours. And that leads to the self-delusion that we, when we infused it with our labor, we did not take anything from anyone else that was theirs. So when Edgar Allan Poe invents the detective story, he's just making plumbing. When I write a detective story, I'm making something special and, uh, and, and unique to me that no one can take without uh, doing me some irreparable harm. And then and from a utilitarian perspective, we ask ourselves, would the world be a better place if you could only write uh, detective stories of Edgar Allan Poe's estate said you could. And it seems pretty clear that there are like detectives. Poe was, uh, I named my daughter after Poe. I'm not a, I'm not, I, I will brief for Poe, but Poe had eccentric ideas. And if we <laughs> said to Poe, you are the arbiter of all detective stories because of murders in the Rue Morgue, we would be a poor world for it. And so uh, I, I am a believer in evidence led. Uh, copyright and patent, where we can sh if we can show that at the margin you produce more creativity, more of whatever the underlying purpose is by enacting some temporary monopoly as specified in the Constitution for the promotion of the useful arts and sciences, mm -hmm. then let us do so. But if we, um, but I if the only thing we're doing is pandering to the self-deception and the the animal sentiment, uh, then. I think we do so at the, at the cost of our intellectual enrichment. Right. Well, and also there's the issue of, um, you know, it is the individual versus the society thing, right? Uh, where the individual does uh, create something that is basically Hegelian in nature because we don't just pop things out of the air. Uh, the information that exists before that, uh, that is your thesis. You add something new to it, that's your uh, antithesis. You get something out of it, that's synthesis. That synthesis is your creation. Um, should you benefit from it? Sure, because you have done something that, that, that no one else has done before. But you also didn't do it independent of the rest of the community in which you live. We do grant, as they say, uh, an exclusive uh, right to profit from it uh, for a certain amount of time. Um, but what's really important about about that is that it is the individual that has the right to profit from it, uh, and so on and so forth. So when you have, and the great thing about individuals is that they die, right? Uh, in this particular setup, because eventually everything about uh, what the individual does stops being of importance to that individual because they are dead, um, and then it becomes of the use to uh, the society in general, unless they previously uh, license it or do whatever else to, to let it let it happen. When you have a situation where, for example, um, the individual dies, um, and then their children and grandchildren and so on and so forth uh, then, then become rent seekers on that particular piece of property. Um, then to go back to the question of is wealth uh, immoral, then you start having the, a, a real question of the morality of it relative to the benefit of the, the society in general. My personal feeling about stuff like this, and I, I think it's maybe slightly different from yours, is I'm a big fan of copyright for individuals being life plus 20 or 75 years, whichever is longer in the case of the individual, because the 20 then allows the, the, uh, 
the person's uh, spouse and family to get some limited benefit after that. Um, but after that, it goes in. It goes into the community um, because, quite honestly, my grandchildren should go either get their own jobs or walk away. Right. right? Uh, one of those, one of those two things. Uh, for corporations, I think seventy-five. And and the problem is, is that you have folks like Disney. As much as I, you know, I, I admire Disney in many other ways, but the fact that every time Steamboat Willie comes up to be about being put into the public domain, uh, they somehow magically uh, get to extend the the life of. Although of they've got only one year to do it now, because we're start to we're coming up against the limits of the twenty year renewal in nineteen ninety eight. Yeah. So we're we're pretty close to it. Don't worry, we live in Trump's America. I hear you. Um, where where legislation passes with ease. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so as far as so as far as that goes, I mean, th there is that thing that at a certain point. Um, the individual ceases to exist. The benefit that the individual accrues from it um, goes away, and it has to go back to the society because the society needs that Hegelian process to create new and compelling stuff. I so. want to suggest a gloss, a well, friendly amendment. Please do. Which is that um, in addition to this, you need an expansive uh, safety valve for, for uh, free expression oh, yeah. that uh, doesn't prevent the uh, author from, or that doesn't allow the author to enjoin people from using their work to criticize their work. Oh yeah. And so you know, I I I think that we worry too much about things like open licenses and too little about things fair. like limitations to copyright, like fair use. Fair use. Right. Our poll star shouldn't be I can write the wind on gone, which was a retelling of Gone with the Wind from the perspective of the enslaved people. If Margaret Mitchell tells me I can. Right. Right. And therefore, what we should do is is kind of work on Margaret Mitchell's estate to let to to get her to let us tell that story. What we should be saying is Margaret Mitchell's estate, and this is what the Supreme Court affirmed. Margaret Mitchell's estate doesn't get to decide. Right. Right. This is and so we don't have to. And in that regard, like the duration of copyright becomes a lot less important. Right. Right. Because one of the greatest problems of the cop of, of copyright. Uh, term is that it is accompanied by a very narrow view of limitations to copyright. Right. And so we not only have a very long-lived thing, but a very wide thing. Right. No, the, I, I accept this gloss and endorse it wholeheartedly. Uh, How are we doing for time? Time-wise. What? We got time for more? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. so next Great. question. From uh, someone who identifies as female or non-binary, please. Yeah. Right here. This one's from Mr. Scalzi. Yes. Really curious how you came up with the ship names for Collapsing Empire, because I enjoyed oh, them great. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, to, uh, specifically, um, it, the, it's a, a sort of sub rosa, not really a sub rosa, but it's a kind of an explicit uh, test, uh, you know, testimonial to Ian and Banks. Right, mm. uh, whose culture series I absolutely love, Cre you know, creates the idea of a uh, huge, um, you know, galaxy-spanning civilization. Now he writes with a sort of verve and complexity, and uh, that I don't. Um, and in the sense of, you know, even just in the sentences. I mean, we all have complicated universes. That's why you love us. But, uh, but just the fact of his culture and the way that he's built that, and there, that there's so much there, and even so much more implied. Um, I absolutely love. Um, and uh, he and I were up for a Locus Award together mm -hmm. uh, when I did Red Shirts. And I remember, and he had just passed or was about to pass away. And I remember explicitly saying to people, I'm, I'm absolutely happy that I've, I'm a finalist for this award. If you were planning to vote for me, please vote for Ian Banks. Because not only was the Hydrogen Sonata a wonderful book in and of itself, but just as a, you know, a proxy for the entire uh, series. I was like, this would be uh, a great time and place to, to honor him. Um, I won. Uh, my wife gave my acceptance speech in which I dedicated it to him because, again, I was like, I won, but he should have. Um, so this is, this is his. Um, and this is my way in, in my creating this galaxy-spanning uh, thing to acknowledge that Ian Banks is, is a master of this particular form. Um, and so every time someone sees that and goes, huh, it's like Ian Banks, it's almost like spinning a prayer wheel. You know, in, in my book, Ian Banks is remembered, uh, and that actually makes me happy. I, I sneak my favorite William Gibson line into, oh yeah. 
I sneak my favorite William Gibson line into about three quarters of my books, which is "Don't let the little fuckers generation gap you." Right, right, right. And it's in like it, it appears in like half a dozen of them. I wanted to ask about that because yeah. you know Earth is a thousand years gone, right? Sure, the sure. Earth is lost to to this civilization, but they're all cool old Tin Pan Alley songs. Do you have a continuity in mind? Is that going to emerge? Like why Tin Pan Alley? I think I think survives. It's, I think it's just basically the classical music of its time. Okay. Right. You know. Right. Um, so they'll they'll pull it off, and I think it's also there may be. Some some sort of thing where you want to, your ship names have to be distinctive enough that they're not going to be uh, that they're not going to be re repeat, right. uh, but at the same time have to be uh, easy enough to remember that you can say them. And right. song lyrics do a really good uh, job of that. I think there's that thing that uh, for you know you shouldn't do this for passwords, uh, but a long time ago people were like, if you have a hard time remembering. I think just use a, a, a initialisms. Yeah, a line or, or, or a line of uh, lyrics from a song or something like that. Uh, you shouldn't do it because those are, once you actually see the pattern, then it gives it all away, and even a machine can figure that out. But uh, just the idea that you can remember a sequence of of uh, words better than you might remember just a single word is kind of interesting to me. There's a thing called Zuko's triangle, which says that identifiers can be human readable, unique. Or collision resistant. I forget what the third one is. Do anyone remember what the third corner of Zuko's triangle was? But but it is this problem, right? That right, right. when you have independent people coming up with identifiers without being able to talk to each other, right, right. that you have this really hard problem. And you can use hashes, but like you know, calling your spaceship the eighty character hash of something is uh, it's it it lacks. It's not a kind of thing that people write songs right. about. Right. It's a, and it's it really is the difference between you know uh, you know having a personalized license plate and having a VIN number. Right. Right. Uh, okay. One last question. Um, you had your hand up first. I'm sorry. So, so John, I was curious about, um, you mentioned in your book that society kind of has this infrastructure that they take for granted, and there's also been kind of this loss of knowledge as to why existing principles, why it kind of existed. And uh -huh. you mentioned that someone, people draw the conclusion that you're maybe referring, or it's an allegory about oil. Um, but uh -huh. I actually think of it as an allegory for another modern day infrastructure that we're a little bit famous for working with that people potentially take for granted. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm curious, especially with one of the groups that's currently tasked with protecting it, um, also recently publishing rules to kind of erode um, key parts of why it exists and why it's important. Um, and, and just this thought that every death is kind of its own destruction of a library of Alexandria mm -hmm. is, you know, you lose a family member, maybe I should have asked them something before they left, or, you know, I lost a team member, and now suddenly for a code, right, like I should have called this function holding a lock, and now I have a race condition kind of thing. Yeah. It's like this information, it's, it's not quite codified, but it's important, and because it wasn't distilled, and because others weren't educated about it, it's kind of lost in time. Okay. Uh, do either of you have thoughts on how we can better... Um, Kind of codify and educate others about these things. Okay, I, you danced around what it was that you were actually trying to describe. I, I thought I for, at first you were going towards Google Books or something. Uh, but what is what is what, the, are you? what were you referring to oh, explicitly? Uh, I was curious about net neutrality. In the oh, internet. net uh, neutrality. Oh, I'm gonna let Corey talk first. Uh. <laughs> well, look, I mean, the network neutrality question on its face should be really easy to square up. Like, even if you don't want to, even if you you believe in markets. Uh, as the so solution to everything, and you think regulation is a problem. Phone companies don't exist without regulation, right? Like arguing about whether or not phone companies should or shouldn't be regulated, it's like arguing about whether or not um, uh, you know, uh, ice cream should be cold, right? Like if you, you're the, the like going gulp fiber network involves going to every basement in New York and paying the clearing price of digging it up to put a piece of fiber in it, that is like uh, umpty trillion dollars and you will never ever recoup it, right? So without some regulatory intervention that gives you these literally priceless rights of way, priceless because you would get this deadlock where when you got down to the last two basements that controlled the, the closing of the loop, those people would just price it at the, like, the entire expected return minus one dollar. And so you know, there's no viable way to build a telecom Without um, without state intervention into property rights, and so if you're going to take the king shilling, right? If you're going to put your copper in our dirt that we clear the way for for you, then you have uh, we have a, a, a you have an obligation. 
to operate that copper in the public interest. And you are welcome to run your network any way you want if you're going to pay all the clearing costs associated with it. But when you're going to use our largesse, right, when you're going to take a giant subsidy, that subsidy comes with a quid pro quo. And that quid pro quo is you give me the bits I ask for when I ask for them as quickly as you can, not, you know, like trading me to another prisoner for a pack of cigarettes, right, going to one, pro, one, one company or another and saying, like, how much will you pay me to, to get your bits to Mr. Doctorow faster than, you know, uh, the guys down the road will. And uh, the fact that you have people who claim to be market supporters who are uh, unable to understand this is, is tells you that, like, the, the, I think it's Mencken's aphorism that it's impossible to get someone to understand something when his paycheck depends on him not understanding it. <laughs> that, that, you know, the arguments are so crummy for allowing network discrimination. And Susan Crawford had a great op-ed about it today. Mm -hmm. I think that we are almost at the point where maybe network neutrality will uh, be very hard to take away because we are almost at the point where we have pretty good networks for enough people that taking that away will cause them to rise up because it's very hard to get people exercised about a thing they've never had that we're telling them their future has been stolen from them. Right. You know, this is one of the problems with DRM is that we say like, they, there are all these devices that should exist now but don't because it's against the law to break DRM even for a legal purpose. And so you stick a CD in your computer and it wakes up some software that came from the manufacturer that says, I see you're visiting us from the 20th century. Would you like to move your music into the 21st? And handily puts it on your on your mobile device and lets you turn it into a ringtone, an alarm tone, and everything else. Stick a DVD in and all it'll do is what it could do in 1996, which is play it, right? 20 yeah. years, not one new feature added to DVD. And, um, people don't notice, right? They don't even notice that there is nothing that happens when you do with a DVD, that when you put a DVD in, apart from what it did 20 years ago. But if they could do all the things with DVDs that they can do with CDs, and then we told them they couldn't do it anymore, mm -hmm. there would be blood in the streets. And what Obama was very canny about was creating an unsustainable healthcare system that nevertheless insured 22 million uninsured people who would then, when that system ran up against the limits of the compromises he had to make with the insurers to get it through, would instead of saying, all right, then I guess we'll go back to the old bad ways, would, would then plump for single payer. Yeah. No, I was wondering when we would get to healthcare on that because that is... <laughs> Because boy, that is the one that you know that that really does bring a uh, point to to what he's saying there. I mean, the fact is is that if all of a sudden I have to pay an extra twenty dollars for the tier that allows me to get Netflix, right, which I already get for free minus the Netflix subscription cost, or the tier that uh, th that it basically goes into the cable model, um, then people are going yeah you know, people are going to freak out about it because um, they. They already have it. That's their already ground level expectation. It's the, the once you give people something and you give it sufficient time uh, to take root as that is the expectation, that is always going to be uh, part of that expectation. And you do have, and you do have basically what are uh, I would say, uh, Randy and acolytes going. Well, no, we should actually do it this particular way and and pare away everything that uh, doesn't allow you to, uh, or that, that uh, has anything to do with the government doing anything other than uh, shooting people um, and saying, oh no, this is more efficient. And, and of course we can trust other people to do that. Um, and it, it just doesn't work. I mean, implicit in a lot of the philosophies that lead to something like breaking net neutrality or taking away the uh, health care that other people have is the assumption that um, the only things that exist are you and the ground no more than six feet under you, right? And so that everything else will just sort of take care of itself. And of course it doesn't, and that's, a, that's the aspect, I think, of both of our books. Everything is uh, interconnected, everything works together or it doesn't, but there's always going to be uh, factors that you have to deal with. Uh, I obviously, and I, I, I think this is a non-controversial statement, think that trying to reverse net neutrality is purely uh, stupid. Uh, it doesn't benefit anyone but a certain number of small people, again, up at the top. Um, it uh, is going to present real issues for uh, the vast majority of people at the bottom uh, and the potential for the internet uh, and the potentials for these networks, uh, which is to 
um, ha have the potential to uh, raise up and then flatten out uh, things like access, things like education, things like uh, communication, uh, goes away simply for the benefit of three or four or five companies and the attendant CEOs and executive class of those. And guys. shareholders. You know, and, and, and bluntly, and I'm sorry that I'm going to use a bad word here on the Google streaming thing, fuck that. You know, I'm not, I'm not here for the top 10. I'm speaking as someone who's in the 1% myself. I'm not here for, for those people. I want the benefit uh, of this for everyone because I also have come down from the very bottom of our you know, US society and I know how crappy and how awful it is and how trivial it is to improve uh, the lives of people uh, at the bottom through things like access to computers, mm -hmm. to things like networks, to things like education. Um, and so every time uh, you, know, you have an administration like this administration, uh, which is just full scale, you know, uh, let's, let's sprint as fast as we possibly can towards oligarchy, because to the rest of you, um, then yeah, I, you get my backup. Um, so uh, the current head of the FCC can uh, go dunk his head in the toilet and flush several times, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we need net neutrality. Fight well the power. Yeah, exactly. Let's hear it again for John and Corey. All right, that thank was you. awesome. Thank you all.